Okay, and our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Christina Hotelin. Uh, she is an independent scholar who earned her PhD in history from the University of South Florida in 2020, focusing on the late Roman Empire with a BA, with a BA in classics. Christina wrote her dissertation on the negotiation of dynastic succession ideologies between emperors and their subject populations between the late second and third century CE, specializing in gender and women, material cult culture, particularly coinage and inscriptions, and digital humanities. As an independent scholar, Christina is interested in meshing her personal interest and love of heavy metal music with her academic research in Roman women. Opting for a career beyond the academy, Christina is a social media manager for the history YouTube channel Invicta. So uh, she is presenting today a paper titled Imperial Whore, Seductress Villain, Messalina in Heavy Metal Music. Take it away, Christina. Without further ado. Um, so the third wife of Emperor Claudius, Valeria Messalina, is one of the more notorious women from the early imperial period. Very little is known about the empress apart from her noble lineage as the great grand niece of Augustus, marriage to Claudius, and the births of their children, Octavia and Britannicus. Can you change the slide, please? With the birth of Britannicus happening around the year of Claudius's ascension to the purple. The birth of Britannicus elevated Messalina's importance because she was now the mother of the future emperor, which signified the continuation of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Despite her importance to the emperor and dynasty, however, Messalina largely dominates the historical record as the embodiment of feminine vices, according to male perception, sexual ferociousness, sadism, and greed. Next slide. Messalina's intimate engagement with the seat of imperial power and influence over the emperor made her a subject of criticism by prominent senators and authors. These authors were motivated by misogyny and political biases in portraying the emperors as anything but virtuous. As a result, Messalina is, solely, is mostly known for her scandalous reputation and conspiracy against the emperor, which led to her execution and denatio memoriae, her official condemnation by the Senate. While ancient sources suggest that it was a sexual affair, there is much scholarly debate about whether the marriage was adulterous or political, meant to secure the succession of Britannicus due to the rising threat of Agrippina. Next slide, please. Messalina's reputation as a duplicitous and alluring woman has persisted in the historical record and found its way into a variety of modern media reception. The perception of Messalina and her characterization as a wicked temptress otherwise known as a femme fatale, have largely dominated modern receptions, especially in the genre of metal. In this presentation, I examine Messalina's reception in metal through lyrics and primary sources from which musicians take inspiration when composing songs. Although the, sec although the sources portray Messalina from the perspective of elite men, I explore the ways in which Messalina's persona has persisted in metal how ancient sources inform and inspire songs about the Empress and what makes her a compelling figure to metal musicians. The longstanding depiction of Messalina as both a seductress and villainess were adapted in modern media reception and continues to prevail in metal, which demonstrates the perception of Messalina from antiquity. It, it demonstrates how the perception of Messalina from antiquity resonates in metal amongst audiences and musicians. Next slide. Ancient attitudes regarding women are generally critical, especially towards women in or near positions of power, otherwise known as influential women. The ways in which in imperial women conducted themselves were reflections of the emperor, regardless of whether there were wives, whether they were wives, mothers, or daughters. Women that meddled in imperial affairs act, acted disgracefully were treated as evidence of an emperor's moral degeneracy and inadequacies according to male perceptions. Such audacious women threatened to undermine the emperor's fitness and the legitimacy of heirs. Messalina finds mention in several sources where she is heavily criticized for her insatiable sexual appetite, excessive squandering of money, deceitful nature, and violent acts of retribution. For the purposes of this presentation, I'll mostly be focusing on the works of Juvenal, Tacitus, Suetonius, Pliny, and Cassius Dio. It's important to note, however, that these writings were published after Messalina's death and as part of her Damnatio Memoriae. 
more than 60 to 70 years after the ascribed events. Next slide, please. Despite this time lapse, the literary portrayal of Messalina by ancient authors had a profound impact on how audiences in the modern era would come to know the Empress. By the 19th century, the name Messalina was used to describe women who were insincere, debauched, and thus embodied the characteristics of a femme fatale. So when it comes to the theme of this conference, metal music and ancient literature share some commonalities. Since its inception in the late 1960s, the genre of metal has largely been a masculine tradition when early metal bands were comprised of men with men writing lyrics on a range of subjects with men being the targeted audiences. Metal lyrics like primary sources usually focus on men's experiences and notions of masculinity with women serving as stock characters embodying quote, good or bad personae. Bad women that appear in ancient sources and metal songs are characterized as beautiful, seductive, and mysterious women that bring disaster to men and inspire others to do wicked deeds, more aptly known as the femme fatales. Femme fatales are particularly harmful because these alluringly dangerous women pose as threats to masculinity and patriarchal order. Men are usually cast as the victims of these deadly women. As bad girls that subvert patriarchal ideas, femme fatales are the ultimate threat to patriarchy because they represent an outlawed form of female divinity, sexual agency, independence, and vengeance. These, tempt these temptresses are emblematic of men's fear over the lack of control to the erotic energy of these alluring women and to femininity in general. In the context of early Roman women, Messalina is among the few that truly embody the dark deadly woman character type. As a femme fatale, Messalina is an obvious choice for musicians because her story provides abundant material for lyrics. This is especially the case in the genre of metal where the, where the genre tends to embrace the dark, macabre, sexual violent themes in lyrics and album artwork. Messalina is mostly praised for her sexual depravity and sadism within the genre. Next slide, please. Indeed. While Messalina and her exploits are celebrated, some bands tend to share the attitude of ancient uh, sources that Messalina is a treacherous woman. Well, those are all the sources that they were supposed to pop up. <laughs> um, so such as American doom metal band Bloody Hammers with their Messalina song. In it, Messalina is warned that her, scandalous and that her scandals and depravity will be her downfall and that legends will recall the head she's rolled. For all the villainous cruelty stained by a river of blood, depravity leads you guilty, fall on the sword, Messalina. And the passages just highlight these examples of her, the rivers of blood that were following her. Okay. Next slide, please. A search for Messalina on the Metal Archives database accumulates 10 results with songs dedicated to the Empress or as a reference within lyrics. The earliest song about the Empress is a demo by Czech power band Ocelot in 1991. Next slide. It's not until 2006 that Messalina finds mention in the lyrics of Russian death metal band Dimensions of Doomed Sacramental Oblivion, where the song's protagonist takes a sacrament with his Messalina to rule their own dark empire together, where the eternal pleasures rule. Next slide, please. Songs about the Empress are mostly faithful to the primary sources and retell her notorious life, largely focusing on sex and violence. Lyrics highlight and embellish the details to make Messalina more nefarious or erotic. Since metal lyrics rely on ancient sources, the ancient author's misogyny and biases are reflected in lyrics. Most Messalina songs are provocative, containing her epithets and sexual escapades and references to primary sources. Next slide. Oh, we're already here. So Imperial Horror by French death metal band Autocrator refers to juvenile sick satire in which he refers to Messalina as the Meritrix Augusta and her long list of sexual escapades. Next slide. Dutch black metal band Countess's Messalina song offers the most comprehensive account of Messalina, including the end of Caligula's reign, marriage to Cousin cousin Claudius and sexual ferociousness, specifically in her contest against the prostitute, as cited by Pliny. 
Messalina is celebrated as the, quote, queen of sluts, empress of desire, and harlot of the gods. Though these songs are faithful adaptations, they are problematic because they reflect the biases of the author for whom they rely upon, and therefore present a very limited perspective of Messalina to the wider audiences. It suggests that the monstrous, oversexed nymphomaniac Messalina is more appealing to metalheads than the historical empress due to personal and imagined notions of deadly women driven by erotic lyrics. It is also worth noting that despite Messalina being celebrated for her sexual acts, words like whore and harlot indicate that she's still being judged by men through a patriarchal lens. So despite being praised, it's not the same type of praise men would typically receive. So um, next slide, please. Ancient testimony about Messalina and her notoriety have captivated audiences. And to understand why, we must ask the creators of Messalina reception. I was able to interview two musicians who offer different approaches and purposes in writing songs about the Empress. Forgive me for mispronunciation. Loic Fontaine of Autocrator and Orlock of Countess. Next slide. The first question I asked both musicians were if they had any formal background in history or classics. Loic answered that although he did not have formal background in either, he had always been interested in history and not just antiquity specifically. Orlock has a master's degree in medieval history and has good familiarity with some of the Greek and Roman authors. So for the second question, I asked both musicians what drew them to Messalina. Loic explained that Otto Krator's first full-length album focused on the worst Roman emperors and Messalina fit within the theme of the album. He was interested in talking about an emperor's wife because as he says, it is said behind every, woman, behind every successful man is a woman. When Orlock was a child, he first encountered Messalina on the hit BBC show, I Claudius, when it aired on Dutch television in the late seventies. To him, the Messalina episode made quite an impression upon him. He explained that when he writes a song, it usually emanates from a melody, guitar riff or vocal line, which gives him a feeling of what a song should be about. This particular melody reminded him of Messalina, which inspired him to write a song about her. Orlock states that while Messalina's story is entertaining and quote, fitting for a metal song, it was also an original subject at the time since the only song he found was Oslov in 1991. The third question I asked was where they each pulled information from. Loic referred to Suetonius's Lives of Twelve Caesar, Tacitus's Annales, and an erotic novel by Marco Lise, Messalina Valeria, Celebrity Empress, an erotic tale of Rome's famed empress. Orlock had already mentioned Messalina from I Claudius, but supplemented using Tacitus and passages from Pliny and Juvenal. Reflecting on it now, Orlock says he would write the lyrics differently. He explains that the lyrics, as they are now, retell the story as it's always been told. Orlock now, however, would prefer to add an element of doubt as to whether the story is true, especially in light that Tacitus, quote, more or less admits that what he writes is basically hearsay, which is the first quote that you see in the slide. <laughs> Similarly, he suggests that other authors have portrayed Messalina in this way to suit their own agendas. Regardless, Orlock does not mind the lyrics as they are. And in a way, the Messalina song is like their other song about Elizabeth Bathory. That song relates to the legend of Elizabeth Bathory, a, hunger, a Hungarian noblewoman serial killer, without addressing the question, without addressing the question of the validity of the legend. Whether or not the legends about Messalina and Bathory are true, however, they are entertaining stories fitting for a metal song. In my final question to both musicians, I asked them how their Messalina songs belong to the overall theme of their album and discography. Loic explained that Otto Kotor's albums largely focus on the bad side of humanity through history and since their first album concentrated on bad Roman emperors and due to Messalina's infamy, she belonged on the album. In contrast, the Countess album that features the Messalina song is a collection of songs about a variety of topics rather than focused on a centralized theme. Nevertheless, Orlock concludes that the song fits in well with the rest of Countess's discography, both musically and lyrically. 
Although Loig and Orlock have different approaches for writing songs about a Roman empress, both musicians were intrigued by Messalina based off their own understanding of ancient sources and modern reception. Loic views Messalina as a successful woman in the context of an album focused on evil, wicked emperors. Orlock was captivated by Messalina from a TV show and later his readings of primary sources. As a quote, woman of dark, dark desires, Messalina fits within the thematic scope of Countess discography, both musically and lyrically. Both musicians chose Messalina as a subject because the stories about her are far more entertaining and suitable for a metal song rather than the historical Messalina. Loic emphasized this point, stating that autocrator songs are, quote, inspired by history, but are not historical references. Messalina's brief stint as an influential force within Claudius's reign and demise leading to her execution is one of the more dramatic events from the early imperial period. Ancient authors wrote about Messalina through the lenses of their own political biases and prejudices against the Principate and women, often building upon each other's works, adding additional details. What we are left with are sensationalized accounts about the Empress. Despite her fall from grace and official condemnation, the impression of Messalina we are left with has largely dominated her, her reception. Messalina's characterization as a femme fatale who manipulated her powerful husband into eliminating her enemies and seduced men is the prevailing theme in metal lyrics. Her reputation as a dangerously alluring woman is more captivating to metal audiences than presenting a historical Messalina. Building off the works of ancient authors and modern reception, metal bands contribute to the reception of Messalina as a devious nymphomaniac. <laughs> Rather than condemning her, however, Messalina is embraced by a genre that encompasses the depravity and darkness associated with her. As Orlock stated in our interview, quote, these are after all metal songs, not monographs. Thank you all. Thank you for that. Well done after all the technical stuff. You did great. Thank you. <laughs> I'm the chair, I should unmute myself and talk now. Okay, thank you so much, Christina, for uh, that wonderful presentation. Um, it's, uh, you know, you touched on a lot of important things uh, that, you know, methodologically with uh, when we look at these, ty these types of songs is the fact that, you know, these are uh, not written by, you know, people who died thousands of years ago that we can't have a dialogue with. Um, you know, this is stuff that's written by, you know, people we can talk to who are human beings, you know, with their own thoughts and feelings. Um, and you can, and, uh, you know, and that's something we're not used to doing as, uh, you know, as ancient historians and classicists and medievalists, you know, et, et cetera. Um, and so that's, uh, and it takes us really, as I was, and it takes us really out of our comfort zone sometimes when we have to reach out to those people. I certainly get nervous when I try to request an interview to for people like this, especially, <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, and I mean, especially because like as a woman and I'm approaching this as a historian and a metalhead, um, you know, I wanted to, I, I was sort of careful and I was a little anxious about approaching these guys because I've never been able to have a conversation with musicians about history before, you know, or stuff relating to their own lyrics. So it was, it was definitely a really interesting experience talking to these guys. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'm glad you did. And uh, I hope more people uh, consider, uh, you know, uh, doing that approach, um, you know, from yeah. in our field, right, when it comes to reception. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, the questions that we have. I think we have uh, uh, some here. Um, I had one from David uh, Parnell, uh, he asks, uh, is it possible for Metal's presentation of women like Messalina to be, be both misogynistic and heroic at the same time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's sort of complicated because like, I mean, at least in the Countess song, like, to me, that seemed more like a like out of all the Messalina songs, that was the most celebratory sort of one, at least. But like that article that um, Charlotte had co-written with um, 
oh my gosh, I, I'm afraid to butcher the name. Um, but um, to Joanne, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I'm I'm sorry. Whoever yeah. says. <laughs> yeah, it's it it's weird because like you know while they're being praised for a lot of the stuff that they're doing, they're still being governed by really sort of abusive language, like being called a whore and a harlot. Um, it's complicated. I, I don't have a really good answer for it. I think it's possible that you can make a woman really badass and heroic in metal, but unfortunately, sometimes, at least with Messalina, it's governed by, you know, some of like her most scandalous and, you know, nasty epithets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, looking when I've been looking at, you know, the reception of Cleopatra and metal, you know, there is that tension between yes they're given agency yes they are preparing as these powerful figures but at the same time they are in the album artwork and well as in the lyrics you know very pruriently being you know the objects of the male gaze as much yeah. as you know doing whatever they are heroic and uh um i like to think of you know i'm not in a position to kind of speculate as to this because i'm a man but uh, i i have asked in the past uh with how the uh reception of these powerful women ancient women in metal has parallels with sort of um the experience of being a woman uh in the metal scene as a musician or a fan or a journalist yeah i mean i think messalina really kind of fits into metal male metalheads um sort of ideal feminine type where she's dark she's mysterious she's you know just you know, around the Tampa metal scene, at least very gothy in that sort of respect. And I think that's what a lot of these men are looking for is that sort of biker babe looking, you know, badass woman type, you know. Um, so yeah, like in that respect, I see how um, a lot of like male ideas and conceptions of women really permeate through all these lyrics uh, across all the songs about her. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered the question. I'm sorry. Oh, no, certainly, certainly. Um, thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, other questions uh, for Christina? Um, this one is uh, a comment, and it's meant as a comment. Uh, it just uh, I just thought I'd read it out. It's from Nathaniel Katz, uh, you know, who also is you know looking at you know the at uh, dynastic transition. Uh, yes. So. Uh, he said, that was fascinating. I'm really impressed, though perhaps I shouldn't be, by how thoughtful their approaches to history were and how open to real evaluation of history they are, even if obviously they approach it differently than we do as academics. He, he referring to the, the artists there. Um, yeah. And I definitely agree with that, that there's such a range of kind of the degree to which these artists are consulting the sources and using this material. And obviously some of them have master's degrees in history, some of them don't. And that's what's so interesting is that like Orlock has a master's degree and then Lodi didn't really have any formal background, but just his general interest in this really brought, drew, drew his attention towards this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it uh, cause it's tricky, you know, you know, as as the ex as the experts in this stuff, you know, we don't want to come across as being, you know, judging them for how well they interpret the sources the way we do. Right. Um, but on the other hand, when they do, uh, you know, invest in in doing that, it, it is certainly um, it's icing on the cake, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Now I'm hungry. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, Oh, actually, we have, uh, you. actually, you, uh, we ended up, you, uh, you didn't take the whole 20 minutes, so you got a, a few more for questions here, oh. so, uh, <laughs> um, so that's, so thank you for that. Uh, so we got another question uh, from uh, Giordano. Uh, he asks, uh, don't you think that this topos of the theme of the femme fatale is transversal also to other music uh, categories or, or transferable? Uh, I think of Baroque opera, for example, Claudio Monteverdi's Incoronazione di Popea, uh, Popea's incarnation, uh, sticking on ancient Rome female characters. I mean, according to one of the books that I referred to about um, imperial, about reception of imperial women, um, 
Maria White refer to a lot of Italian opera, a lot of opera music, um, because Messalina and a lot of these imperial women show up in those operas. It's just, I, I haven't really delved into it enough to really, to really thought about it. But I know that there's a whole lot of work done on that subject, which I think is really fascinating. It, it does make me wonder about other genres, like, I don't know, probably rock, but I can't think of any other that would talk about an empress. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the song Papilla by uh, Theater of Tragedy um, from their album Aegis, which has some other uh, beautiful tracks on uh, ancient mythological women. Okay, uh, we uh, thanks again, Christina. I think we're gonna.